Hi, everybody. This is Gary Van Antwerp from Training Magazine Network, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar today, Transforming Novices into Experts, Faster and Cheaper Ways. And our guest speaker today is Ray Hamann. Is, Dr. Ray Amen, as I should say, Chief Learning Architect at Vignettes Learning. We're going to turn everything over to Ray in just a few moments. I do have some extra information I'd like to give you. Uh, Ray is going to be, along with many other speakers, going to be at the online learning conference presented by Training Magazine this September in Chicago. And you can learn all about that by going to onlinelearningconference.com. But don't go there uh, until you jot down this number, TMN2, because that discount code will save you $200 off the registration fee. If you're anywhere near Chicago or you can get there, it's going to be a great event. It's going to be um, uh, uh, co-located with the Allen Interactions User Conference, Michael Allen's company, and that's a big event also. You may want to go to both. Ray, you're going to be presenting a, at the OLC. Can you tell us again uh, what you'll be doing and about your workshop there? Sure. I, I will be doing a two-day uh, pre-conference workshop on scenarios and storyline, how you use storyline to do scenarios and how do you design scenarios. And then I also have a three-hour clinic on story-based e-learning design. So it will be fun. Great. Thank you very much, Ray. It's a good opportunity to network, too. And I notice many of you have introduced yourself over in the chat. For those of you who just joined us, go ahead and keep doing that. Let us know who you are and uh, what you do and, and where you're joining us from today. So, Ray, thanks again. Uh, Online Learning Conference is going to be a great event. That's also where the top video training awards are going to be, and you can learn more about that at that same website, onlinelearningconference.com. Now, we just added some new webinars, too. I just added these day before yesterday, and we don't even have the top Topics, the titles nailed down, but I wanted to let you know about these folks because you are here today. And and we've had all of these speakers before. I, you can recognize their names right now. You can see that on July 1st, Ethan Edwards from Allen Interactions, we did a, a webinar with him back in February. Very successful, excellent uh, content uh, for that. And uh, Alan, uh, I'm sorry, Ethan is going to be here. And then Jane Bozarth, is, uh, who's the e-learning director for the state of North Carolina, will join us on Jan uh, July 31st, August 5th, Michael Allen from Allen Interactions, the CEO, will be back to join us. Uh, the last time we had him was in, I think, November. He did a great webinar then. And then Kevin Thorne, good friend of Ray's and mine, is going to be here. Kevin is the chief Nugget Head, the CEO of Nugget Head Studios, and he'll talk to us a lot about graphics and uh, and probably, we're nailing it down right now, but also uh, about using graphics in storyline. He's got a lot of experience with storyline, so I know many of you are interested in that. So we'll, we'll get those nailed down for you. You can find out all about them uh, by going to trainingmagnetwork.com, and all of the free webinars uh, are easily accessible if you just click the button in the uh, upper right-hand corner on calendar of free webinars. Notice you can also find all the recordings, including this one tomorrow, there, as well as all the white papers that we send out for free. Every one of them is archived there, and you can download now, I want to thank uh, Lynda.com before we turn things over to, to Ray. They are sponsoring today's webinar. And, you know, one way to skill up your, your novices and maximize your training ROI is the online video instruction available at Lynda.com. The teams and departments and organizations all around the world use Lynda.com training to promote professional development and support IT migrations, close skill gaps, and so forth. Um, they offer thousands of videos online uh, across hundreds of topics that can help your organization increase efficiency and effectiveness, whether you're migrating to a new version of Windows or building custom workflows in SharePoint or gaining new skills in subjects like leadership or time management, just about anything you could possibly think of, uh, there is video training available at lynda.com. So if you've never visited lynda.com, we strongly recommend you set aside a little time to explore the vast selection of topics and videos uh, there and sign up for a free trial too to consider how lynda.com uh, can help your organization. I'm just going to give you a link in the chat right now. You might want to copy that down for use later on. And thank you again to lynda.com for sponsoring today. And now we're ready to turn things over to Ray. Uh, again, today's session, Transforming Novices into Experts, Faster and Cheaper Ways. And uh, my good friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Ray Jimenez, Chief Learning Architect of Vignettes Learning. Ray, it's all yours. Hi, thanks, Gary. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our session today. This is Ray Jimenez, of course. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, if you are in Bogota or you are in China 
or you're in Geneva, all, all wonderful places. I'd like to, uh, to let you know that we're going to have fun today, as usual, with our topic in terms of transforming novices into experts. So can you confirm you can hear me well? Can you confirm, uh, please? Hi, Sylvia. Good morning. Great. Very good. So we are moving forward, and as you can see, I have downloaded, uh, provided you handouts, and also prior uh, link that you can have as a reference as part of your study in our session today. Now, I will be very, very interactive. So for those of you for attending the first time with my session, be ready. We're going to have a lot of action and fun. Now, I have done a little bit more work in the area of e-learning. I wrote a three-minute e-learning book, do-it-yourself, scenario-based learning, micro-learning, and I have a couple more books coming up. One is Small Bites Learning, and then the other book coming up is on story-based e-learning design. So this will be wonderful to you. Many of the experiences I'll share to you today comes from my research and work in the area of story-based design, uh, problems uh, solving uh, story based design and others uh, that I have been studying over the years in order to add on to become having an effective uh, way of developing a learning design. So let's start, okay? Great, very good. So type in the chat, what are the traits of a novice? Could you type it in the chat, please? What do you think are the, good, nervous, <laughs> lack of experience, okay, good. Clueless, thank you. Sylvia, thank you. Ah, lack of knowledge, lack of knowledge, shy, run, very good, thank you. Kathleen, eager, timid, <laughs> overwhelmed, <laughs> hesitant, insecure. Okay, very good. Well, you certainly know uncertain, etc. The one way or the other, you and I, or in some areas, we might be considered as a novice. So, no ability to theorize, very interesting there, Tiffany. And uh, motivated, real good, Sylvia and Debbie are curious. Thank you so much. The next question to ask you is, what are the traits of an expert? Can you type it in the chat, please? Confident, experience, very good. Thanks, Janet, thank you. Ah, confidence, broad knowledge, very good. Uh, holistic, knowledgeable, results-driven, go-to person, very good, Nancy, thank you. Ah, uh, Sylvia again, thank you, Laurie, thanks, Leslie, mentoring, that's great, troubleshooter, that's very, very interesting, right, adaptable, hopefully willing to knowledge, guru, <laughs> thank you, Ellen, for sharing that, consulting, Dawn, thank you, able to apply knowledge, very interesting responses from everyone, so in your opinion, how do you bridge the gap between what you call the from novice to an expert. What, what do you think should be done? Give them practice, mentoring, dialogue sharing. Debbie, thank you. Ellen, thank you. Mentoring, practice, 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 practice. <laughs> okay. Provide uh, resource sharing. Excellent. Okay. Uh, teamwork, opportunities, trust, confidence. Greg, thank you. Uh, Donna, thank you. Guidance, very nice. Safe uh, environments to fail. Kathy, that's excellent. Okay. Brainstorming, provide jobs, provide tools, practice and reflection. Incredible. Okay, good, very good. So they, they, many of your ideas are in mark uh, on the top of what you're talking today, I say topic. So one of the items I'd like you to do, and here you can use your pen. Uh, Gary, can we enable their pen? Use your pen, which is on the right, left-hand side of your screen, and encircle the items. Use your pencil. In the items on the left-hand side, what are those that describe a novice? So the pen is there, as Gary's pointing out. Very good. Single solutions. <laughs> I love that. Okay. <laughs> You're quick, guys. Discovery. Okay. Ah, single solutions, very good. Problem solving, process orientation, very good. We have a very, very interesting uh, distribution. Single solution is dominant. Retention, no retention. <laughs> okay, problem solving, great. Everybody's having fun here. So you can see that the trend is primarily on here, 
the single solution person. And then, you know, you're talking about quick response. And then, of course, you're talking about discovery. Interesting that people are having this response. Very good insight. Now, if you ask the same question to you, in the items on the left, which one describes the experts? Can you type it or can you encircle it? Which one describes the expert? Single solution means when there's a problem, they only provide one solution. <laughs> ah, boy! <laughs> Problem solving, okay. Variable solutions, very good. Results, very interesting, okay. Results, I love that, okay. <laughs> oh boy, we have a color shop here now in the Christmas tree, July 4th. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> it's July 4th. <laughs> I believe we've used the pen on this slide enough. <laughs> okay, very good. I love this. Okay, now when you look at here, therefore, what is very interesting, studies have shown that experts tend to have this type of capability. I mean, problem solving, discovery, they're more process oriented versus results oriented. Now, this is quite intriguing and interesting. The, the novice looks after the results quickly, the expert looks for the process, and why do you think that is? Can you type it in the chat? Why is it that studies have shown that experts focuses on the process, whereas the novice go right after with the results? Process make the result. Exactly. Repeatability, experience. Thank you, right? Ah, okay. The process is important. Very good. Very good. Tom, Mary, very nice knowledge of the results. More than one right answer. Exactly. So the study is very, very interesting impact because the novice usually jump in and come up with a result whereby the expert makes sure that the process is in place in order to come up with the results, right? The novice delivers the results without necessarily reflecting on the process of how he came about the result. Another interesting idea also was the concept of variable solutions versus single solutions. Most experts have variable solutions. They have different ways of doing, looking at things. And then in other areas, the novices are usually focused on the area only of single solutions. Now, very interesting uh, that I have also discovered based on my research is that the novices tend to have quick response. They're very, very quick, easy to quick response. The experts tend to find more time for discovery. Why do you think that is? Experts are focused on discovery, whereby uh, novices are really just quickly trying to respond. <laughs> and they just gratification. More curious naturally, novices don't know. What they don't know, anxious. More information leads to better results. Ah, very interesting. So the experts knows that the more information they have, the more they discover, the better off they have with the results. Very good. Uh, uh, Brian, nice. Real complex problems. Experts want to get it right, so they take time to discover it. Whereas the novices, okay, new fewer options, you might want to look into knowledge. Excellent. So this is our interesting comments in here because you could see that as you move forward, we begin to begin to realize that. There are ways, therefore, that we can accelerate transforming the novices into what you call the expert by sharing uh, some ideas in that area. Another insight that I have gathered based on my, after doing this for a while in the research is that it seems that novices are probably good in retention. That's why they're high in retention areas in here. And they're starting to taper down. They have the higher results in their area, immediately reacting to it. But they're very low in the area of single solutions, as you'd notice it there. However, most of the experts have very high capability in problem solving. Now, problem solving is an interesting thing. So what's the difference when we train our team or our people problem solving approach versus retention approach? What's the difference between these two? Problem solving versus retention learning, right? Critical thinking, okay, that's part of the problem solving, very good. Result teaches understanding, very nice, Andy. 
very good empowerment. Uh, teach them how to fish. <laughs> Thanks for that, Greg or George. Gina, systems thinking, applicability, conversion versus diversion. Sue, thank you. Donna, fixing ah, fixing the problem, finding the gap. Very good. So key to to um, memorizing results. <laughs> You remember when you were new in your jobs, when we were new in our jobs, the steps are 1 to 10. We memorize the steps 1 to 10. I don't care what they say, but the only thing I have as a novice is 1 to 10. I'll follow 1 to 10. How many of you have attended a, uh, <laughs> a sales training where you provide a script, right? You provide a script. Oh, the step is 1 to 10. The client is saying no. He still uses the same script. Right, because he works on the checklist. So he's very oriented by retaining what he has done, right, rather than analyzing the problem solving uh, situation. So these are very interesting in terms of reflection on how learners uh, learn in different conditions. What is going on uh, in the linear environment that we're in today, we tend to separate content design, delivery, and assessment. We sort of, for us, Generally, there's like a content design, there's a delivery, and there's a dissetment process. What is going on, though, in the world of trying to reduce the time of transferring knowledge or trying to reduce the time in order to deploy products, companies are starting to become in a situation right now, and many of us are familiar with this, with the concept of the flat environment, right? So when you have a flat environment, it's a different environment altogether. So my question to you, and you can type it in chat, which environment promotes faster transformation of novices to experts? Can you encircle which, uh, with your pencil tool? Uh, Gary, can you do that? I like people penciling their tools, right? Okay. You encircle which one, okay? Okay. What promotes uh, faster transformation? The novice? Okay, good. Okay. So you have a lot of linear environment. Interesting, okay. Ah, flatter environment. Some people, <laughs> I love it when people are really bold red one. Okay. So that the predominant reaction is in flat environment. Could you type in why? Can you share to us why? Just one idea. Why do you think? It may depend on the topic. It uh, depends on your own learning style. You write, of course, uh, Sylvia. Uh, more ideas shared, needs practice. Very good. Simple and easy to follow, linear steps. Practical steps and perfect, right? Okay. <laughs> Look at this pink area. <laughs> I love this. Okay. Uh, allows more freedom. Dreaming best way to learn. Support building structure and knowledge base. Accessibility to information. Okay. So we have a dominant approach. The flat approach really impacts in terms of transforming our learning design. So what is going on now is that we have content in here from a design point of view, a delivery point of view. Flat is more organic. Thank you, Vita. And Mary, you keep going back to the reiterate the concepts. Very good. We now have flattened, fused, granularized, condensed. There are many other ways to decide, design this, but the longer, the, the longer are they separate steps. The reason why is that it promotes more problem solving, discovery process, and variable solutions if all of our content, our delivery, and our assessment simultaneously works at one time, okay? Now, how do you identify what fits who? Very good question, Ed. It's a very interesting question. Let me show you some information, and then we can respond to that, who would fit who, because the question of who would fit who uh, sometimes uh, assumes that there are some background information or experiences. We'll cover that in a short while. Now, what it does not work is this. What is not workable in a flat environment is this case. Now, this is an interesting thing because somebody approached me and said, you know, Ray, we have a certificate program for processing all our engineers, and they are required to read 9,000 words. Now, not even read. They just need to click the pages where there are 9,000 words, right? <laughs> Now, why is that not workable in a flat environment, right? <laughs> Engineers required to read 9,000 words. It doesn't have to. It means not read, but even to click the page that has 9,000 words, and they get certified. So, why is that not workable in the flat environment? No comprehension, no iteration. Thank you. No inter retention. No interaction. 
because there's no learning needed, right? Uh, they're learning to, to, to click. Yes, they are. They're smoozing. <laughs> I love you guys. Okay, very good. So, right. So, again, because I uh, don't know, follow up is only one way to solve the problem. Very good. No practice, no application. We not did all the content already, right? So, this type of pro program, uh, which I call real linear and real controlled environment, really discourages the environment for flat environment. That way we can help learners transform into better experts, right? Uh, ineffective or no reinforcement or reinforcement of skills. Now, there are many, many programs like this. Many of our programs are designed like this. You like the end of it all. It's a one-time event. Go in and people go out of it without really picking up a few things. We hope we test them that they will learn something, right? So you're saying here, uh, Bivens, very good. People think scenarios as they are good concepts. So the alternative approach would really be to make the content becoming more decision points, driven, uh, problem driven, open ended, short, micro, flexible, portable, platform, multiple platform, and configurable. So instead of having one line content there, what you're doing is you're making them available for learners to go through and choose and pick what they want to do, provided they have a direction of the end result that they want to accomplish. Does it make sense to you that you loosen up, you unbundle your content, you make your content free, and you make your content open, short, micro, flexible, portable, multi-platform, so that you can develop it in desktop, in your tablet, in your Room, right? So yes, it's a small bites approach, Sarah. <laughs> exactly. Because otherwise, you cannot free the content, and therefore the learner cannot grasp the content very quickly. Okay. So how do you control prerequisites? A very, very interesting question. Prerequisite assumes that there's a big argument that on this one right now. Really, really a carry, because. Many of the people uh, are trainers, and this is my opinion only, my humble opinion. Many of the trainers, designers, and leaders assume that people don't have the lack of information completely. They're like blank in their minds. Fortunately, when we hire somebody, we already pre-screen them that they have some amount of skill or understanding about the domain or about the area. They may not be an expert on your specific content, but they are generally familiar with the area. If you hire an electronic engineer to become an electronic engineer, then they know the principles of engineering. Or if you hire somebody to be a cashier, they know the principles of being cashier. They may not know the brand of your cashiering, right? So they have some amount of knowledge. So that question of requisite is very interesting because a lot of companies require people to go through this requisite process without providing that they already have prior experience that can work on that basis. So that's really for you to determine piece by piece. The only caution I want to put in is let us not undermine what they already have as an experience and use it as a basis for building on that, right? Okay. Uh, additionally, uh, instructing professors on how to do things in Blackboard, like assigning points. Well, that's a <laughs> that's a skill set, right? So you provide them a few of the points, and then you let them go out and do and practice it, right? Okay. So here I have provided you an exercise, and what I will do is I will use my screen right now and see that uh, we can do this exercise, and you also have it in your screen. But I want to make sure that you can. Uh, let me go back to my screen in here and confirm for me that you can see this. Now, you also have this link. I will demonstrate it to you, but I also want you to open it up if you like, okay? So can you see my, uh, my uh, page here? Okay, good, very good. So this exercise is just very interesting, and I'm going to show it to you for your own purposes. I've developed this because I wanted to demonstrate to you that there are things like topic, like view a car, read how to cook, imagine how to ride. If I were to uh, analyze them, this is a high thinking kind of uh, high thinking type of activity, right? Okay, plan a vacation. Let's, let's say call them high 
plan of vacation, activity, etc. and the like. They are drive by car is still thinking, right? Uh, over there, ride my enjoy my new car, uh, creating an explosion, uh, visit the Eiffel Tower. So now when I look to the acting, you're looking at really simply saying, okay, I'm acting, I'm really doing real acting in here, create an explosion, I'm doing this kind of activity, whereas the others are basically less acting but more thinking process, right? So if you do it together and if you plot it like this, you begin to see a picture that there are tasks that are thinking-wise, more of thinking, but there are tasks that are more acting in this regard. The interesting thing when I show this exercise to you is this. Learners tend to want to do more acting situations, more situations where it matters to them. Rather than watching a TV, they might want to really do buy a car and test drive a car, right? So this is just an illustration for you to go back later on, as you can see, as an exercise. Another one is an interesting thing, which I'm going to ask you a question right now. So here, security measures is thinking, right? How to stop a car is thinking process. Steps uh, on a problem. These are now thinking processes, quality assurance. But creating a secure login is now really, when you look at that, high on acting, right? And then now stepping up on the brake is high acting. Assembly a product line is high acting. Wearing goggles is high acting. Conducting a product test is high acting. So when you're looking at this right now, your result suddenly becomes different because you begin to differentiate why people prefer the thinking process or the acting process. So my question to you, and you can type it in the chat right now, is this, right? Uh, when you're looking at that, what is the most preferred way that uh, attracts people or attracts you when you're learning? Do you spend more time thinking about it, or do you want to do something about it? What do you think? Acting, doing, right? Do it, acting, interacting, doing something, right? So we tend to do it. We tend to act with it. Very good. The acting, thinking. Some would be acting and then thinking, but really you want to jump into it. I remember like buying a furniture at IKEA, if you've been to IKEA, you don't really read, <laughs> many people will read the guide, I don't read a guide, they just open the box, right? Open the box, let's do it. I'll make a mistake, but it's more fun doing it rather than reading the guide, right? <laughs> yeah, doing but they need to think too, of course, along the way. I wonder how many of you really need to think a lot. Uh, but people usually don't jump in and think about things. They just do it and discover along the way, and they go back. I then think about what happened, right? Okay. But this is just a, a, a reflection that people have some preferences. In the next exercise here, you can see, and by the way, uh, you can uh, do this uh, by your own time later on, assuming that there is an intensity, right? And what learners prefer to focus an exercise too. Assuming that there is a five, which is what the learners want to focus on, and there's one. So you can do this exercise later on, but let me show you a reflection in here. So here are different uh, uh, subjects, like there's policies, there's formulas, there's tools, there's overruns, downtime, breakages, bottleneck, blowouts, rejects, workaround, objects, etc., and the like. Now you begin to see that if you play around this, and I will give you a hint, where does it fall? Can you see that? What tends to fall in four and five, and what tends to fall in one and two? Can you respond in the chat? What, tend, what items tend to fall in four or five, and what items tend to fall in number one? Anyone, can you see that? Yep. Failures, very good, okay. Aha, uh -huh, very nice. <laughs> okay, situations, problem solving, immediate attention, four to five, very good, right? Okay, rules versus creating problems, nice tool. Problems, creativity in four and five, okay, processes fall in one and two, very nice. Things requires acting in four and five, one and two proactive, the four and five pre uh, reactive, very good insight there, Megan. And then, of course, uh, Okay, uh, exactly, right? The real world, uh, one and two is probably uh, academic setting and advanced, right? 
So you begin to see that as you move forward, you begin to see this exercise here, and you can play this with yourself, that people, learners, tend to usually jump into four and five items. When a war run in that area, I want to run, I want to do down, deal with the, the, the downtime, I want to know how to fix the problems with the bottlenecks, I want to worry about the workarounds. Less people are really interested in what is the policy, what's the procedure. They only want to understand the policy, the procedures, the processes in relationship to four and five. Do you agree with that? Most of the time, we only bother to go back to one and two only because we need it in number five, right? Okay. Does it make sense to you? Even tools, right? Okay, very good. So take a look at this exercise. Uh, it's in your link in there right now. So I'm going to show to you uh, an example of what we have done. And, and this is an interesting exercise. You also have this link, right? Uh, I hope you have this link right now. I'm going to enlarge it a little bit. Okay. Can you see this now as an enlarged screen? I'll go slow to make sure that everybody can see this. Okay, very good. Okay, good. Let me know. Type a yes. That way I will not be rushing. Okay, good. Very good. Now you can see here that in the design process, we're talking about how to organize something to make it uh, help learners from a novice to an expertise. So approach number one, the original approach here was very interesting. Uh, when we approached this project, one of the requirements that were given to us is very interesting. The company said, you know what, uh, we want them to be trained on what? Okay, they want them to be trained on these topics. We have a formal session on programs and lessons, objective, operational excellence, drivers, methods, blah, 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 applications and tools. Aha, another program on pre pre preparation, setup, planning. So they have all of these programs they develop, engineering, preventive maintenance, solutions, problem solving. So their program in performance improvement have all of this in place, whether e-learning, classroom, or PDF reading, they have this type of their face, right? So another aspect of this is approach number one is this, okay? What happened is immediately we focus on the waste areas downtime, problem solving, and performance improvement. And then after they focus on that, they go into the stories, the scenarios, and the games so that they can deal with the problem areas. So what's the major difference between so far with the concept of going to a class, attending a program, which is approach two, and approach one? What are the major differences here? Can you type it in the chat? <laughs> Relevant, okay, good, thanks, Mitch. What else? What's the difference between approach two and approach one? Approach one, attending a class, going to all these lessons, eternally. People stay awake in number two, very good, okay. Number one is fun, okay. <laughs> very good. Satisfied, thank you, Angela. Learner versus instructor. Classes can be relevant, etc. cetera, and the like. Very good. Participating, actor Teresa, thank you, Linda. Number one makes it more information, right? Okay. So what is going on in here is that you bring in, directly you bring in the learner into a situation so that they deal with the issues, okay? And how did we arrive at this? This is very interesting. So with the company that we work with, they have this like about eight to, to 12 big manuals, which runs for a 16-week, <laughs> remember that, 16-week certification course, right? I was about to throw up, right? But anyway, 16-week <laughs> uh, program. And then I asked them the question. I said, okay, you have a very nice program. You've definitely done it for the first past few years. I asked him this question. Which of these topics are people interested and they spend time to? Guess what? They spend time in rejects. <laughs> they spend time in broken things. They spend time in uh, 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 breakage. They spend time in bottlenecks. Rarely do they spend time in trying to figure out step by step, memorizing the policy, checking the policy, reading the details of it. In fact, the policies and the procedures and the metrics and the standards only became relevant because they jump in into the specific cases and situation. So 
what we have done, therefore, here is to granularize the process. So instead of forcing everyone to go here in lesson approach B, we allow them to start with approach 2, and then guess what? We ask them to go back to lesson approach 2 if they need more information to solve the problem in lesson approach number 2. Does it make sense to you? We did tell them, okay, finish the course on the definition of hydraulics. We just told them, go start solve a problem, and if you want to go back to hydraulics, you go back to hydraulics. Does it make sense to you so far? We did it completely different, right? So somebody was asking a question about prerequisites. So here now is the question. We made the programs available, but we didn't require them to the programs because we know they have some amount of experience. So now what we did was we throw them to a situation, case studies, case stories, games, exercises, activities, but really looking at this situation, and then we bring them back to the situation, right? Okay, let me pause so far. Does it make sense that people pay attention faster to actual real-life incidents, and they will go back to the content if they need to go to the content, right? Ah, okay. Very good. Now, this material was also included in your link that I gave you, so you can download it later on. So let me give you an example. Uh, I cannot enlarge this, I'm sorry, but this is also in your link. I will not finish it because it is an audio, but it's just a good thing to show you what we have in here. Too much downtime. So the topic is too much downtime, right? Instead of, okay, what are the steps in production line? The first thing is too much downtime, right? <laughs> and then you now go, you are a cable operator, you go forward and say, okay, uh, there's a certain audio that cooperated, they ask you to stop the process, and then you're looking at what will happen if I stop the process, and the guy is getting mad, yeah, you let me stop the process, right? <laughs> and the guy will say, well, I'm going to retool everything, and they're like, now what happens to this, you go inside in here, and then look at the software on the impact for that decision, right? So when you go through this process in here, what you're doing is you're asking people to go to the actual content as a process rather than studying an academic situation, you put them in that area, okay? I have a question in here from Kathy. What if development time does not allow correcting the program to this approach? Well, you know, uh, that's a good question, and probably you can have a scenario. It doesn't have to be like this. It could just be a problem solving uh, even in a piece of paper, and, and we have done that a lot. You develop a problem solving in a piece of paper, and we have people go out and solve the problem by having a conference or a discussion room or submit them online. So you can be very inexpensive in this approach. It doesn't have to be a scenario. Now, I have a question to ask the group, okay? Very quick question, very interesting question. When they are showing here the screen of the computer software while they're discussing the issue, are they also touching or covering the content that is also taught in the classroom or in the procedures? What do you think? I want to repeat my question. Yes, right, Angela? So what is going on in here is that they are looking at the content that they were studying in the procedures and the process of understanding a software, but they're looking at that content from a context of a problem. Does it make sense? They're looking at the content of the procedure and the software application based on what they see in real life applications, right? Okay, very good. Okay, so here's another example which is going to be very interesting for you and I will keep it at this level right now. Uh, this is again in your, the software becoming meaningful in the context of the scenario. Very true, yes, and also in real life application, right? Because you want to bring in your content and your scenario into together. Now here is another situation, and by the way, you have this in your link, so you can go back later on. This is a bottling company, and we've provided an overview, right? And of course, you click up here, there's an overview of the learning process, okay? Now, when you go back in here, you, they can go back to each one of this. As you can see, for example, if you go back into this one, it's all focused on issues. 
insufficient CO2 infused into the product, right? Instead of simply saying, learn the step-by-step -step procedure to quality control CO2 level, the focus is insufficient CO2 infused into the product. Swollen bottles, oily film after carbonation. Can you see that difference in terms of the topic? <laughs> okay. Right? Can you see the difference? How long, how long to develop? Uh, in the first, this one is very inexpensive to develop because it's very simple, right? Okay. So now if you go to number three in here, if you go to the leaky seal, we give them a short scenario, and this is very simple. There's a guy talking. There's an audio, but I will not play it. They're saying, hey, how come the seal is leaking, right? And then they go forward, and they say, oh, what happened to this one? Why did you not fix it? And again, this is very simple. There's no audio, no video. Uh, there's an audio, but no video. And then they talk about this guy. Oh, we just checked it yesterday. The O-rings might be defective, right? And then now the guy's looking at the O-rings. And then now, this is an interesting part. They are reviewing the records of the maintenance of the O-ring, right? Okay? So what are we doing here? What are they learning as they're developing the records? Can anybody answer the chat? As they're looking at the records of the O-ring and that actual production line, what are we allowing the learners to do? Uh, troubleshooting, right? Okay. Ah, very good. Very real life practice, very good. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Uh, so what performance is required to the workers is very interesting. Now, the, the, very interesting, in the design, Sylvia, the design already incorporates that by the time they touch this, they would have gone know how to troubleshoot this area. That is the objective of this point, right? So they have to check the records, okay? And then they have to check the documentation, so now, as they're learning the case, they're looking at the documentation, which is part of troubleshooting, right? Okay. They give forward in here. Now they're looking at the different seals, which is part of the expected performance that they need to do. I need to investigate what are the seals in here, what are the different kinds of seals as you move forward. So instead of lecturing about seals, memorizing the seals, or going to the seal factory without understanding the value of the seal, here the seals are being discussed in the context of troubleshooting, right? Okay. So, of course, there's a correct answer in here, which is this one is damaged, as you can see. So if they picked that, they would have done it, check mark, and then they go into a scenario that they will have to have a feedback or a response process. So you can see here that we have developed a micro micro lesson, micro events, which is a leaky seal, there's clogged nozzles, there's bent or misshapen assemblies, misaligned injectors, wrong calibration, right? So the topics are problem solving, discovery issues, rather than retention, definition, policies and procedures. Now, where will they go? <laughs> where will they go if they want to know the more detailed information which we usually spend time on. They go click to the references, right? Can you see this? They go click to the references, and then now you can go back, allow them some information on the details of the O-ring, all the dimensions, right? Okay, can you see that? Or they can go back and see the grand design of the O-rings, right? Okay. Now you notice it that this is a uh, this is a PDF on an HTML page. Is that even a fantastic uh, page by page narrated uh, different page and location? Or they go to the failure analysis of each part of the O-rings. They have now details analysis of the O-ring. So if they want to understand in more detail, they come back in this area, right? Now in classical typical certification course, what do we do? We start here, right? We start here in the common seal failures. We lecture like this. We lecture one, two, three, four, five, but we don't bring in the context of why this information is important. Does it make sense so far? Can you see the value of, of why this reference is here? So somebody was asking about prerequisite. This is where you put in the prerequisite, but instead of requiring the learners to go to prerequisite, 
you make them discover the prerequisite on what they need so that they will be able to do it. Now, I know that there will be issues. Some people would say, oh, people don't know what they don't know, and therefore we have to spoon-fed them. Uh, you're probably correct in some situations, but that very thinking is, is exactly what stops novices to jump in into expertise because unless they memorize something, we don't let them discover something. Here in our approach, we're saying let them discover something, and if they encounter a problem, then let them find the solution by doing their own reading and researching what they need to research on. So we're making sense so far, right? <laughs> and that separates the motivated from the just get by guys. Exactly. And that's the purpose of the learning design, as, as we all know, right? So this example is what we call the example in here. And let me just go back to my slide a little bit here so we can have a back to my presentation. Let me see how I can jump in here. Oops, why did I go over there? Okay, and where we are. I'm going to go jump a few slides in here so I can ask you a few questions uh, in our discussion in, in this area here. So very quickly, I just want to ask you the question here. Overview, how does it help the learner to learn faster by giving them an overview of the entire process and allowing them to jump in to a specific part of the overview? Anyone, can you type it in the chat, please? Connects the dots, very good. Doug, very nice. Aha. Uh -huh. Seeing big picture sets the stage, sets the stage. See the whole picture. Sylvia, thank you. Uh, JD Dutch, thank you. Nancy, context, okay, very good. Now, in the classical way, we require them to go through like, okay, we want you to go to the class one by one, and therefore we want you to go to uh, step one, Step one, step two, step three, step four. This is what you call a controlled environment. The problem with that is that you wasted so much time and effort to let people go through all of this, which they will not remember in many, many cases. So what we're simply saying is that allow people to jump in to areas that interest them the most or challenge them the most. You can, of course, create that environment, but now people are touching on the areas as they move forward, right? Okay. Very good, uh, Dave. Uh, points lead to JT, GIT learning, right? Okay. Allows for choice, Sylvia, Kathy. It blends nicely with what you heard with Macy. Very good. Okay. So that's a good, good example. Another question to you is this. This is more of a recap of the point we said earlier. In the embedded content, right? So when talking about embedded content, how does it help that learners are seeing content embedded in the troubleshooting, right? How does it work? Okay, it is right there, exactly, right? Real world experience, as you can see. Context make it sticks, okay? They don't have to go looking for it. The reference materials are there. Absolutely. If you want to talk about uh, journaling uh, or product report or quality report, you put it in the situation. You put it in troubleshooting or problem solving, right? Now, the most important part, I think, here is really the ability for learners to be able to make decisions, to solve problem solving, because the major difference between a novice and an uh, expert is that the novice are so used to rules, one, two, three, four, four, five, so they have only one or two answers. The experts, after they go through one, two, three, four, five, or while they are learning one, two, three, four, five, they go to a real-life situation they now begin to see that there are different ways to approach an up, a problem. There are different ways to solve a problem, right? Okay? So mimics normal work behavior. Ellie, that's beautifully said. Uh, the JC Dutch, they will be recognized when they see it in the real world. Absolutely right. They connect it to the real world in a better, better way. It never works. The say the book says it works. <laughs> Angela, I love that. I had this experience. I bought a, I bought a furniture. Uh, a iron furniture for my gar garden, right? You know, the, the steps one, two, three was followed, but after 30 minutes, I have to disassemble them. You know why? Because I tightened all of the corners of the furniture. Now I know that I don't have to tighten it because if I tighten it, then I have to do it again. But the manual did not say that. <laughs> right, Mike, right? The, the manual did not say that. So putting the learner into real life situations allows them to reflect on that better, right? Again, the value of references. Can you respond it in the chat? What is the value, biggest value of references 
while on the job, while they're learning. Type it in the review again. Very good experience is better experience. Thank you. Security, Gina. Farther learning, not to forget. Okay, helps them. Very nice, Debbie. Okay. Aha. Uh, interesting. Now, when you design a course like this, will this be a one-time event course, or is this now open for a continuous learning opportunity? What do you think? Ah, continuous. You know why it's continuous? What makes it continuous? What makes it favorable for people to use it, to be continued, right? What In this environment, what makes it easier for people to reuse it? Pick what you need. Exactly. <laughs> Easy to update, right? Okay. Call it, visit, and need it, right? It also can be connected to your performance support system, or this can be your performance support system, or review later on. Most of our courses in e-learning, unfortunately, are so one-time event-oriented, right? I'll go there. I finish the one hour. Heck, I will never go there. <laughs> I'll never go back there. Why? Because I'm like hammered down by all the tests. <laughs> I have to memorize. I don't care. I don't want to go back there. Here in this environment, the flat environment, you're able to produce that kind of results. I want to show you a final example in here, which many of you probably have seen this when I've shown. So now the issue is how do we support collaboration online? Okay. So what we have done was to develop a system which we call expertise system. Okay, can you see this in my screen? Can you confirm you can see this? Okay, good. So you have an expertise system. So people can ask a question, right? So people can ask a question anytime they want to ask a question. But now you can see that there are key questions to help them out. So you ask a question, anyone, because now the entire, uh, the entire learning community or the batch of people you want to learn have to have some questions. And then you can also put in here my expertise because it tells them exactly where you're good at because of what you've entered and the kind of answers that you have done. But if you go down closer inside in here, you begin to see that, can you see this one here, best practices, solutions, ideas, tests, and results? Can you see this? Can you tell me a yes in your chat? Can you give me a yes if you can see this? Okay. I just want to make sure. Okay, good. Ming, thank you. So instead of asking people to post openly like most social learning, you can curate is the word. You can begin to manage so that the contribution of people are more substantive rather than superficial. Does it make sense? How many of you have been to Facebook or LinkedIn or somewhere, social media? 95% of the entries are like what? Okay. <laughs> Less of learning, but more of like socialization. So in this kind of environment, you want people to be more active, proactive, right? In the sense that they are going to contribute. So when they contribute in the community like what you've shown you, you post an answer, you are going to be required by the system after, of course, some uh, orientation that you have to, is it a best practice? Is it a solution? Is it an idea? Is it a tested item? Or is it a result? Therefore, you are pre-qualifying your contribution, and it becomes easier for people to appreciate the fact that your contribution will have more meaningfulness to it. And then the other component in here that you can see, can you see this crisscrossing lines? Okay, this crisscrossing of lines means that a learner can also link one idea to another idea so that it maps out in their mind. So if I click this basic planning helps, if I click that, it actually jumps directly to the content. Did you see that? So I don't have to be lost in all of the text in the world. I can go basic, uh, 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 I can click this one, take ownership, and then it now goes back to the take ownership component in that area. So uh, this is not social learning. It is collaborative and an expert system that allows people to contribute in a more specific way to accelerate there. Now, if you have a system like this, where is the best place to use this in your endeavors for accelerating uh, transformation of novices to expert? Anyone? Anyone in the chat? Where would you apply this? How would you apply this? 
Can you type it in the chat? Anywhere. <laughs> I love that, Sylvia. Okay. You can apply it all anywhere, right? Performance support, all throughout, expert system. Really? Okay. Good. All disposable of any employees, right? Exactly. Experts mentoring novices. I love that, Gina. Uh, a message board for employees, right? You can also use it when learners are actually doing problem-solving projects, right? So you have an assignment for them. Or even in real life, you can tell them, let's use this because we're having a project that's in front of us, right? Best practice, Gina, that's very good. So here, as you can see, what we have done is to able to complete the process, what we were trying to show you earlier is this. This is now what we call the system. And by the way, we will be introducing this in Training Mag Network. They call it Path to Expertise which is not fully developed, but we will implement this in Training Mag Network. Everybody who attends a webinar will be able to get some kind of a certificate of attendance and be able to publish their path to expertise on where they focus on. So if you want someone to be focusing on a certain expertise area, you need to be able to allow them to demonstrate, to show that that is the area of their interest, and broadcast that capability. What will happen if you broadcast that in your company? That this individual is building expertise in that area, right? What thing will happen? Great idea for motivation. Very good, Sylvia. What else? What will happen to the learner? What will happen in your community, right? Uh, great for promotion. Individual becomes better expert. Get noticed, Donna. Very good. Because they're different motivation, right? They grow. They take pride in their work and the collaboration and empower, the great recognition. They also have a path to follow, right? They have a specific path to showcase. They're not just, they're not just running around with that path and showcase. Cross-pollinate good ideas, very good. They show their contribution, Janet and Karen, thank you. X-rays, opportunities, yes. <laughs> now what happened, what's even best if you can publish this openly to the marketplace, right? <laughs> we'll be celebrities, yes, <laughs> Vida. Promote systemness of the centralized workplace, better outcomes, right? Okay, very good. <laughs> so let me go back to my screen in here uh, and can go back to our slides. And perhaps let me ask you a couple of five parting questions before we adjourn. And I have a couple more examples in the links that I've done to you today. Could you answer this question? What one idea have you learned today that you could apply immediately in helping transform novices into experts. Type it in the chat, please. Customer support, that's a good way to apply it also. Flat learning, flat environment, give the big picture up front, focus on problem solving scenarios. Very good. Have, uh, have been searched the answers. Very nice, Joyce, very good. Showing uh, the big picture, reusable materials, I like that, Brian. Uh, Julie, thank you, very nice. Pam, Sylvia, make scenario based and repeatable. Make certificates, very good. Contextual learning, Kim, thank you. Focus on application to scenarios. Empower learners to scenarios, using scenarios. Oh, by the way, since you're mentioning the word scenarios, I run a scenario based workshop <laughs> with training uh, magazine, okay? I'll send you a copy of my air in it. Love holding details from courses and add to resources, exactly. Very good idea, Gwen. Okay. Excellent. Now, you have the links that I gave you, and you can have that as a part of attending our workshop today. And in a nutshell, we are moving into the world of flat environments now. We cannot anymore run our projects like we're running uh, cyclical and linear models. We need to keep on moving in that area. And consider looking at my workshop on story-based technical design, because this material I mentioned to you becomes part of that in terms of scenarios, story-based, situation learning, and developing an architecture. And then, of course, I have another workshop uh, online, which is a story-based webinars, which is exactly sharing with you how I do my webinars, which you just saw one. OK, so unless you have no other questions, I'm going to turn it back to Gary. Any questions so far? We probably have a minute that to do. Where do you host a flat learning experience? It's a good question. Uh, huh. Yeah, in uh, a server, if you have a SharePoint or any other server, uh, later on you can share it also in the Training Mag Network um, in, the, in our 
latest version. Okay. Thanks, okay. everyone. Ray, yeah. thank you so much. <laughs> what an hour packed full of great, uh, of great I know. contact. <laughs> yeah, great. So we want to invite everybody to uh, comment in the chat there. And, uh, uh, and while you do that, we want to make sure we thank Linda.com one more time for uh, uh, for sponsoring today's event and encourage everybody to visit Linda.com. And we're going to open uh, that on your desktop, so make it easy for you to visit. Ray, thank you. This sure. yeah, was a great hour. I had fun. I always have fun, right? Everybody <laughs> had fun? We all have fun. Okay, good. <laughs> you bet. All right, Mr. Short. See you later on. Okay, take care. Bye-bye, everyone. Have all fun. Right. Send me an email if you need help or anything. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye-bye, Ray, and thanks, everybody, for coming today. We really appreciate you uh, taking time out of your schedule. I, I know you didn't feel like it was worthwhile, so be sure and let Ray know how you feel in the chat. Uh, I'm unable to see the chat right now, but uh, uh, but uh, my colleague Phil will uh, will answer any questions you have. If you need any help, well, you can go ahead and, and uh, put that in the chat as well, and we'll be happy to, to remain here for a little while after uh, after everybody uh, leaves, so we can help out anybody else. We will be shutting down uh, the session in a in a couple of minutes, so we can start processing the recording. So, Philip, if you can help with the uh, with uh, any questions or requests in the chat, that'd be really great. Sure, Gary. I am here. We're just getting some very positive uh, comments and feedback. Thank you. Great. Mitch, hello. Vita, thanks for attending. William, thank you for your comment. Hi, Mitch. Glad you could uh, make it. Great. So many people uh, today. Good. We have lots of great new webinars coming up. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning of the session that we have uh, uh, more with Ray. Uh, just set those up uh, in June, July, and August. So be sure and go to the Training Mag Network homepage and click on uh, upcoming webinar calendar button on the right-hand side, and you can uh, look at all those and sign up for those. And be sure and join us in Chicago for Ray's session there on Storyline. If you missed that, check it out on the recording. He, he describes what he's going to be able to do in Chicago. And once again, I uh, want to thank Linda.com for making today's webinar possible. I did put the link in there also, and the page should be displaying right now for you. Great. Looks like Gary. I don't see any questions from any members. Okay, great. Well, we'll remain here anyway, and so we'll pick up uh, any that you have. Phil, thanks for your help today. You are welcome.